next up we have napalm vocalist for hiatus coyote talking with jasmine santayana about art music and being your own person she has a pink undercut and bright green eyeshadow, a huge safety pin over her heart, and sits surrounded by tribal art and a small porcelain lamb friend. Hey. Hi. Sorry I'm late. No, no worries. I was worried. I know that Scott said that the link was super confusing. So I was just like, oh no, like I hope it went through. But thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, of course. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as well as you with all of this stuff, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm good. I've had a really beautiful morning. Yeah, my, it's my sister's uh, birthday, so we're doing this, like, murder mystery theme thing, and so if you can, like, see in the background, it's, like, really crazily themed, so, I thought yeah. that was your house. <laughs> no, like unfortunately. Like Harry Potter or something. No, it's not, <laughs> but it would, that would be something else if it was. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just a mystery that they found, like, a themed house that we could, like, do, since obviously we can't be hanging out with people right now. <laughs> Um, so I know that Hiatus Coyote has finished their album. Um, what can you kind of tell us about it and how does, does it relate back to Choose Your Weapon? Uh, I mean, all of our music relates to itself because it is the extension of us collaborating. So like, you know, every, every song is its own universe. You know, like even with our first record and with Choose Your Weapon, like we, we never created an album, like we don't do concept albums or thematic albums. They are like each song is its own little universe. So, I mean, I guess it's similar in the sense that it's like the evolution of us as, create, as creatives. Um, yeah, but I guess something throughout all of our records is duality you know i i like juxtaposition and you know i've lived a pretty crazy life and there's some heavy thematics that as an artist i need to process and it's always intentional for me with my writing to address these traumas but ultimately it's a it's a catharsis and a place of healing for me and my intention is for it to be healing for other people and to be a sanctuary. So, you know, there's there's always that, both the light and the dark throughout all of our records, you know, and, and I think it's like, yeah, like there is this, there's a Rumi quote that goes, um, the wound is the place that the light enters you. And, um, it's something that's really, I'm really conscious about when I write, you know, it, it's important to, you know, when you endure something, hopefully you gain wisdom from it and to always impart that on, on, in my writing and to my audience is that you can struggle, but there is, there is always beauty in that. And so, yeah, there's always the juxtaposition of that happening throughout all of our records. So I mean, and with this this next release, you know, it's um, the world is crazy. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and had to go through all the surgery and the facing my mortality. So there is a lot of emotional juice in it. Um, yeah, but I'm really proud of it. And um, there's a there's always birds it's always good to have animal friends on the record and like um my parrot that I had for like nine years died last year and um we've got like he was on the he was on choose your weapon as well but we've got like a little interlude with all of his bird sounds which is was really special to kind of have him on the record too
Oh, that's super special. I didn't, I didn't even realize that. Um, and I listened to that. <laughs> On Choose Your Weapon, there's a song called Making Friends with Studio L. And we were like, we were tracking at the studio and I had a break and I went outside and there was an owl. And so the end is me singing with an owl. So there's an owl on there as well. Oh, that's yeah, super. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of touching on that a little bit. So I, I'm wondering, you know, how has the pandemic and just, you know, the time that we're kind of living it, how has it affected the way that you kind of consume and produce music? Uh, I mean, the only thing that's really changed is not being able to tour, which in a way has been a blessing because like when, cause Melbourne, we have like some of the strictest lockdown laws in the world. And like, we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to leave our suburb. And, and so like, when it first happened, no one had other things they were doing. So it just, I basically just like lived at the studio and it meant that we got to complete our record because we had a lot of time to work collectively. So it was really beautiful. It was actually a really beautiful creative time. And I feel like a lot of artists, there'll be a lot of great art that comes from this pandemic, I feel, because people, you know, like society, generally likes to validate who you are as a person by what you do you know it's like often the first question people ask like so what do you do you know and and I think you know I'm really fortunate that in my life I found my purpose earlier early on and I managed to make a career out of it so my life my my job is is just an extension of who I am whereas there's a lot of people who work jobs that they might not necessarily love, but you know, you gotta pay your rent. And so when people can't go to work, it forces them to, like, you know, you see people like learning how to bake bread or like, you know, work on their gardens and stuff. And I think it's, it's a really beautiful way for people to, you know, it's like, the earth is essentially sent us to our rooms to think about what we've done. And <laughs> it means that like people, people have the time to explore who they are without the identity of what their job is. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, we luckily we got the album finished before cause the rest of the band in the studio is in another suburb. And they all live to, they all live in the same suburb, but I'm in a separate one. So we were literally making stuff up right up to the day when they like we weren't allowed to leave our suburbs. So I got really lucky with the timing of that. And yeah, it's been a, it's been a bit hard, even though we've already finished our album, not to just go to the studio every day because it's really um, it doesn't feel like work. You know, I love I love to do it so. Now that I'm isolated in my suburb, I've been writing a lot of songs and it just means, you know, we've, we've got more material to play with when we can all get back together. Yeah, um, I, I kind of wanted to dive into your creative process a little bit more. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty clear through your music that you're also really into science and different cultures. Um, and at first, I want to I want to touch on that science piece. So you have a song called Moby Streak and also Borderline with my uh, with your atoms. Um, and I've watched some of your other interviews and you talk about how your songwriting is just like so meticulous and detail oriented, which, which clearly comes across. Um, I guess I was wondering, you know, how do you get your inspiration and translate that into your writing process? Like, can you speak to your, your process there a little bit more? Uh, I guess I'm just a nerd and I'm genuinely really curious. I mean, I guess Mobius Street, for example, was um I liked the idea because like with songwriting traditionally the form is like you know you have a verse and then you've got a, a hook or and then you got a chorus and then you do another verse and then you go to the bridge and then you're out you know and I and I wanted to play with the mathematic structure of how a song is put together and initially you know it didn't go as deep as I would have liked but initially like um, 
I was looking at the MC Escher's The Staircase, which is like an, it's a... I love that piece, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the illusion is called a Mobius strip, and it's something that is, it, it's, like an, it's like a mathematic illusion that makes something look infinite. Um, and so I structurally wanted to play with that. It's like, how could you translate that visual into like a song format? And um, which is why, like, there's like, a, there's like a hook part that's like, kind of like the chorus where it sounds like the intention was for it to sound like I'm singing in reverse, but without any um, effects you know, like to do, to be able to do that live, um, to kind of replicate that, that, um, the fluidity of something that is, you know, just, just playing on the thematics of illusion, you know, and so it's like, the part I'm talking about is like, it's like, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, which is like, a very weird line but like I didn't have any um you know you could just like sing something and run it through an effect to like reverse it but I'm like how do you do that without without all the bells and whistles of production and um you know and they're just it's just like it's fun to write when you've got a theme you know yeah it's kind of like it gives you more to to play off of as opposed to just you know typical kind of like relationship songs or whatever yeah um, yeah so i mean i guess i i don't it's it's a hard question like it's it's a tricky thing to talk about and I often see artists squirm when they get awesome it's like where does your inspiration come from and how do you translate it like <laughs> It's like you basically are interpreting how you see the world. And I guess I'm naturally really curious and, you know, obsessed with looking, you know, like Wikipedia is like my best friend. Like I love even just like a single word and then like looking at the origin of like the origin of it culturally and then finding ways to expand on that. Um, and it's really... It's a really fun way to write, you know, it's like, because naturally I've already got a lot of emotional things to process, but rather than it just being like, I am sad about this, it's like you can, you can, I want it to be layered enough that, you know, essentially people can listen to it in the future and like you can always, like I love find listening to old records again and finding something new that I might not have noticed, you know, and, it, and if it's too obvious and you give it away, it's like, you know, even if you really love the movie, there's only a certain amount of times you can watch it. But if there's all these little Easter eggs in it, then it, 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 it invites the audience to engage with it for a longer period of time and to like grow with it, you know? So that's always something that's always a really strong intention in, in my writing. Yeah, no, that's really great. Um, uh, so I was, I was talking to someone on your team and they, they were talking about how you're interested in making um, an all-inclusive clothing line. Um, I don't necessarily know how far into the process you are. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess you're talking about, like, I, I wanted to, basically, like, when I got my breast cancer diagnosis, it's, um, there was a lot of pressure from plastic surgeons to have reconstruction. And they're like, you know, if you want to feel normal, this is what you can do. And it's, and it's a very invasive surgery, you know, like, and I remember being in the plastic surgeon office and like, she's showing me all these like silicon implants and she's like, we have to do multiple surgeries. And I was holding the weight of it. And, you know, I was like, if I'm going to, you know, they had all these excuses like, oh, it's good medically for your back to have a balance or whatever. But 
I guess I just, um, there's just not a lot of cool representation, you know, and, and I've, breast cancer affects like one in five women and my mother died from it. And like, there, there's no, like I looked up mastectomies and it's all, there's nothing fly, you know? And I just like, and nothing that tailors to young women. And, and like, it's an illness that is often like, oh, when you get older, maybe you'll get it. But a lot of young people get it. And like, I basically just, I just wanted to rock it and own it. And like, like you can still have confidence and you can still be sexy. And like, basically like with this conversation with the plastic surgeon, she's like, you know, we're don't worry, we're gonna make you as normal as possible. And it's like, but I'm not normal. And this, like, your life is forever changed. So why would you wanna try and recreate something when you could just do something new with it, you know? And, and so, yeah, so I, I was like, you know, looking up, it, it all started cause I was looking up like bras, you know, and like bras for one titty. And all the mastectomy lines are bras where you have like a thing to put another pad in. So it looks like you have two. And it's like, I don't wanna look like I have two. I have one and I wanna rock one, you know, and so, um, initially I, I had an idea to like create like a lingerie line, which is something, you know, because it's, it's often something it's like, Oh, hide the fact that this has happened to you. And it's like, you know, fuck that. Like be, be like, I don't know, be like a cartoon character superhero. That's like, you know, had their arm amputated and now they've got like a robot fucking like, like there's a tattoo artist who was an amputee and um you know and that's like his his whole like profession and creative expression is tattooing and he actually had a biomechanic arm built that has a tattoo machine in it so now he does he does tattoos with like a bionic arm so he can like he can like program it so that it has like precision and stuff and so and that sets him apart. You know, he could just be another tattoo artist, but yeah. he took his misfortune and turned it into something really iconic and unique and beautiful. And um, I feel like there's a lot of pressure to like, to conform and to, to try and fit in. And, you know, I guess my, I, I want to celebrate the difference in beauty, you know, and, and, and also just like be, be representation for other women who are going through the same thing. And I, I really, like when I went through this medical procedure, like so many people wrote to me and they're like, you know, I was, I, I was pressured and I had all these complications and I, you know, and, and I think just by being transparent, transparent, you can allow people to like be themselves because they can see they can identify and they can see themselves. And I feel like representation is massive from like, you know, like racial representation to like people who have disabilities or like, you know, or like trans, you know, I, I feel like mainstream media is like now starting to expand a little bit more, but it's only because certain people have, there was always someone at the forefront. There was always someone who took the risk you know, and like, and I just, uh, I, I don't know, I haven't really, I haven't really, whenever I was looking it up, all, all the, all the photos were like, like even mastectomy tattoos, like a lot of them were like people tattooing bras and stuff. And like, and I was just like, well, you have all this real estate, like, why not put like whatever there, you know? And I like, I, um, I have, this really beautiful designer who I met through Erica Badu and she, I, I took a mold of my breast before they removed it. And um, she made me, I'll show it to you. She made me a golden boob. Oh, that's super great. And also I was always too like, I never wanted to get my nipple pierced, but now my gold boob, has its nipple pierced so I can like hang shit off it, you know? 
And like, or you, I can get like, I want to have like a Kintsugi one or like, you know, one that I have snacks in or one that's like got a fish in it. Like, it's like, if you're going to carry the concept of carrying like silicone around is like, if I'm going to carry weight, like let it be something dope, you know, or something that I resonate with. So yeah, like, I mean, I've, I'm kind of just like doing baby steps and I, I've worked with a bunch of um, like couture designers to make me like, like one breasted things to wear on stage, which is just for me personally, but I, I would love to eventually kind of expand that and make make it accessible for women who do decide to have a mastectomy and not go through the regular you know the regular like reconstruction route because there is a lot of pressure you know what it's not like even when i was like mm, actually i'm good i'm just gonna have one titty and um and i'm gonna rock that they were like they're like, well, you're probably going to regret that later. And they like tried to make me see another, like a psychologist. Like I had to see a psychologist anyway, but they, they made, they were like trying to rebook me in because clearly, um, you know, like, oh, obviously I'm, I don't want to do that because I'm traumatized instead of being like, actually, I know who the fuck I am. And you know, like, and the fact that they were so adamant to be like, no, you really want to go this way was like, and I'm stubborn and really strong minded, but I've had conversations with fans who have been on the same boat, who have gone with the surgery because they're like, it's a scary old situation. You know, it's like you have a medical professional telling you that you need to do this when it like, actually the health risks are way crazier than if you don't, you know, like, there can be so many complications and um there is a there is like this societal like peer pressure to conform and i just want to kind of like offer something else i guess that's yeah <laughs> um yeah so kind of touching back i know that this is something that you're super passionate about i know that you use your platform to to talk about quite a few marginalized folks i know that you're from australia so um you talk quite a bit about the aboriginal uh folks there and then i know that you were also talking i think before about people in brazil and, and like kind of the things that are going on there um would uh is is that stuff that you kind of just do on the side of music um like just you know advocating for them and like researching all of those cultures um i guess i don't really see i see how things are more the same than they're not you know it's not like oh i'm a musician and then in my spare time i dabble with this it's just like you know i i feel like indigenous communities are at the forefront of like um environmental protection and and i and like i don't know there's, it's just there's so much um trauma and abuse that happens to both indigenous people and to the planet and and the thing about indigenous communities is they are often still really engaged with the earth. And they have this like, this incredible like intelligence and bond and understanding of the natural world. And I feel like the world is turning to shit because, because you know, like colonial and westernized civilizations are so far removed from that. You know, and like, and even like take the bushfires, for example, like it's in the same in Australia, but also it's happening in California is that the traditional custodians of the land have cultural backburning and, and like in Australia, like it's a, it's fire country and California is too. Like it's part of the natural, um, you know, it's, it's part of it's part of the natural like evolution of that place. 
but they have this like deep wisdom and understanding of that. And like, you know, like there's traditional um, like fire custodians and basically like there's, and firefighters do it now in a modern way, but they just don't have the, uh, the knowledge, I guess, you know? But like basically like in Australia, in a place where there's like, you know, fire country, they would back burn and they would, they would burn in like, so they would burn off in the season, in the wet season. So the big trees, the bigger trees are like, are too wet to catch on fire. And then the smaller like shrubbery will burn off. And then once, this is a really like bastardized explanation of this, but like, so then when the summer comes around, because it's already been burnt off, it's not gonna catch on fire like that and create wildfire. And they've had this like, this deep understanding and have culturally burned forever. Whereas like, because of the colonial like invasion, they, they deny them these practices. And now we've got fucking the craziest wildfires because of climate change or whatever. And it's like, this these fires wouldn't be as, out of control if traditional custodians were just allowed to manage the planet that they deeply and culturally have understood for like ever you know so i feel like you know the reason why i don't know it's not something i seek out i guess i just like i just i respect i respect a lot of indigenous culture and and I think the whole like becoming high, higher profile was kind of squeamish to me and I didn't really like it. It was like, you know, I just want to be a nerd and make music. But I realized early on that if people are paying attention to me, I can shed light on things that might not get the exposure and people can learn about it. And And so it comes really natural to me. And I've been really blessed and welcomed into like, you know, like that I've, I've met really special indigenous communities, both in Australia and globally that have been generous enough to like welcome me into their world and show me their beauty. And so for me, it's an honor to be able to share that and to show people that because it's, you know, it's intentionally kept from people, you know, and yeah. And it's intentionally silenced because of, you know, essentially it's tied in with a lot of fucked up, like, cologne, like genocide and shit, you know? And yeah. rather than recognizing that and like trying to fix the errors of the past, it's, it's like, it's easier to ignore it because it's directly related to capitalism, you know? Like for example, and in the reason in Brazil, like, you know, like I was really fortunate to stay with a tribe, the Barinawa tribe in Brazil. And they've had crazy wildfires there too. And, and it's sent, and like basically what happens is like, they have to log the Amazon to create room for agriculture, which is like, and, when a lot of indigenous communities are there, there's like, it's quite illegal and corrupt. And so often loggers light these fires. And so it's like, oh, it's a wildfire, but really they're just like burning off all of this rainforest. And I have a, I have a girlfriend, Anna, who's from Brazil and she's, she's how I met this tribe. She, she's very close to Metza, who's the, the Pajé. And she was saying she was staying with a tribe in Brazil and they're the most beautiful people and they were so welcoming and they like really looked after her and some loggers lit a fire in their territory and the chief was putting out the fire and he got arrested by the Brazilian government for starting the fires, you know? So it's like, it's really fucking corrupt. And if people don't know about it, people don't, like this shit can continue to happen, you know, because it's like, it's so far f removed from like, you know, the social fabric of like the internet and shit. And I, and I just feel like if you can get people engaged with the 
like the beauty of these people, then they're more likely to care and like ride for them when injustices occur, you know? And I, I think, yeah, like for me, it's more just like, I admire, I deeply admire, you know, the um, indigenous communities and their, their wisdom and their relation to the planet. And I, I just, I feel like it's an honor to be exposed to their beauty and also to be able to share that with other people because the more people that engage the you know the harder it is for like major corporations to just like eradicate them you know and instead of like being super like to me it shouldn't even be a political thing you know what i mean like it's seen as like oh you're an activist or that's political but to me it's like that should just be like the way of the fucking world and like and just by standing up and like sharing you know the beauty of indigenous cultures is like that automatically makes you political because it's at the center of it anti-capitalistic which like runs the whole fucking world you know and so and I feel like people need, like working with um, Jason Guruwiwi, who's the ceremony man at the start of Needlepore. Um, like that's a song that's, it, they're called Songlines. And it's basically like, it's a song that's passed down from generation to generation and they're like thousands of years old. And he trusted me with that, you know, and and he shared that, like, the first time I heard him sing, he just, like, it's not, like, performative. It's not, like, oh, I'm entertaining you. It's, like, it grabs you by the fucking soul. And and I was just, like, in tears listening to him sing. And so, like, you know, it was, it was an honor for me to, that he trusted me with something so sacred and to be able to use my platform to expose other people to it, you know, and... I've had lots of people write to me and they're like, I don't know why, but whenever I listen to this, it just makes me bawl my eyes out. And it's like, yeah, cause it's, it's magic. It's real. It's real tangible fucking magic. And I will always ride for that, you know, like, yeah. I mean, to the best of my ability, it's like, there's, there's always more you can do and there's, you can always like learn, you know, and, but it's worth trying, you know, and um, yeah, it's, it's an honor really for me rather than like a duty, you know, it's not like, it's not like an obligation that I have to tick a box so that I feel like I'm a good human. It's just like, if anything, I'm, j I'm just blessed to be, ex to be exposed to such beauty that I want to share it. You know, it's like when you hear, I don't know if you like hear a song you like and you want to show it to your friends and be like, yo, check this out. This is beautiful. Or, you yeah. know, this flower smells really good. Or here's a, you know, here's a painting that is dope. Like art connects people. And the best way to kind of like celebrate that is by sharing, you know. And so I'm in a position where I can use my platform to share what I think is beautiful you know yeah yeah um i i know that earlier you said and i think you say this quite a bit that you're just a giant nerd i i just want kind of wanted to you know pick your brain on like other things that you're interested like i said i know it, it's very clear that you're into science and culture what else have you kind of been into uh over the last couple of months um i mean i'm pretty simple i've been spending most of my time like garden like in my garden and like I'm making all the fonts for our album so I've been doing like typography and like making costumes for videos and shit like yeah like I made I made this moth mask out of like aquarium plants super cool you know, just like little bits and pieces um yeah I don't know. That's a really broad question. It's I know. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> what am I into? I I guess the same shit I'm always into, like nature documentaries and, you know, writing and, yeah. There's no like 
Oh, I recently learned how to do kintsugi, which is the Japanese art of repairing ceramics with gold. And the philosophy behind it is that they believe that something is more beautiful when it's endured suffering. And instead of discarding it, they illuminate the cracks with gold and it becomes more beautiful because it's because it's endured something. And so like, yeah, I guess it's like, I related that to like my breast cancer stuff and it, it's like you can, there's no such thing as a mistake, you know, there's always an opportunity to evolve and, and grow and make something unique. And um, yeah, so I did like a little workshop. It's not the traditional way, like traditionally it's done with like resins and like actual fucking gold. Um, but I, I just learned how to do like, I, I did a course where you just use like arrow dye and pigment and I actually fixed my hape pipe, which is like, traditionally it's gold, but I just got like pink pigment. Oh, that's really cool. So you like, yeah. So just like little crop things. Cause that's the thing is I can't really like leave my house. So, so yeah, just like little projects like that. Yeah. Um, who are you listening to right now? Uh, I don't know. I'm writing a lot. I, I don't really listen to much music when I write, but I guess there's like two playlists on Spotify that I'm always adding to. And one's called Random Shit Nay Listens To. And it goes for like four days and there's no order and it's very random it could be like it could be like saharan blues to like you know the theme from ghost in the shell to like you know 1950s brazilian orchestrations and shit so i'm constantly updating that whenever i find something new i add to that but um yeah so that's what i'm listening to i guess like I've been really obsessed with Osibi lately, which is more co like globally known as High Life. And it's typically from like Nigeria and Ghana. And um, there's a particular type of Osibi that's, Osibi is like the traditional name for it. And um, there's like a particular type of Osibi where they play like the chords and minor. So High Life is usually kind of, it's kind of like, in the same vein as like Rocksteady or Calypso and it's like it's like joyous and like up tempo and stuff but there's whenever they use like minor chords which essentially translates to sad chords there's just something so hauntingly beautiful about it you know and so like I have a friend who um deeply child he like he spent a lot of time in Nigeria and he basically goes to like he goes to recording studios and and like quite often like artists will record and then they only sell a certain amount of records or whatever. And so they got crates of like amazing music at the studio and he'll just like roll through and he buy them all and then like and then sell them. So he's got like a really rare collection of um of like Osibi stuff and he gave he gave me this one record that I adore and I've tried to find it online like it's not on YouTube it's not on fucking Spotify it's like just vinyl and like yeah it's it's I'm really spoiled and it's a, it's like my favorite record yeah but I listen to everything it's like it depends if you either go, if you go in random shit and they listen to, that's what I've been listening to. It's, it's like, it's all over the place. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Um, do you maybe have any advice for, for people that, you know, are writing their own music or are in the, in the same process that you essentially are in? Um, I guess like, I have a list of words I like. So whenever I hear a word that I that I like, I'll add it to this list. And sometimes it's like, you know when people 
are talking to you and maybe they say a word that you don't know instead of being embarrassed that you don't have some elaborate vocabulary like i'll be like what does that mean what and then like or if i'd like the sound of it or the way you have to use your jaw to like say the syllables and i just like rack up a list of words that i like and i add it and then whenever i'm writing sometimes it's like if i don't even have a theme or something i need to process but i just feel like writing i'll go through and like find a word and just start from there you know or like it's good often when I'm writing I, I like sing melodies and I write hooks that don't have words and then I go through my list of words I like and then depending on like sometimes can methodically do it so if it's like if it's a vocal run that's got three three syllables to it then I'll go through and like look at all the words that have three syllables and then see which one works um, which is like it's a, it's a fun way of just kind of compartmentalizing it when you do, you know, because the writing process is not always just like, oh, here's some like genius shit. Like it, there, there is moments where it just leaks from you, but you also have to, you have to um, stick at it and like curate it and work on it. And I, I have a philosophy that most songs that I write, they already exist in some kind of dimension and then I hear it and I'm basically the custodian of it and I have to try my best to articulate and translate what I hear and like you know and sometimes you never get get it all the way but it's worth like I feel guilty if I abandon them you know if I, or if I have an idea or a song and, and it's like oh that's not that cool and you put it to the side it's like it, it want it, it shows you it wants to exist you know and so you owe it to your, you owe it to wherever it came from to like try and translate the message so yeah i'd say you know don't abandon your ideas because they're not necessarily like the dopest thing ever from the get-go like sometimes they take time and sometimes the creative process isn't natural but you can there's little tricks that you can kind of keep the ball rolling. And then once you get a bit of momentum, then it's easier to keep it going. And then you got a song. Um, um, so I know that when I was talking to your team, they were saying that you do have another album that are in the works. Is that that's just on pause now because because of uh the the borough situation with uh with you and your band is that correct um well i mean we've we've just finished an album so that exists and we've got to like you know we're having conversations with record labels and the thing is when you have an album you need photo shoots you need video shoots and there's content that goes with the release so the most frustrating thing is we have this album, but we can't do any photo shoots. We can't do any video shoots because like, I know a lot of people in like the States are, and there's like certain, um, you know, there's like log logistical things that you can do to make it work. But Melbourne at this time is really strict. So we can't do that right now, but you know, like even the next album that we've got most of it done, like, that's not going to come out like we've got a we've got a whole nother album that's going to come out first so there's no pressure to get it done it's just more we like creating and it's fun to work on you know and and especially because um, we're not touring we may as well be making stuff and also like we haven't released anything for five years because you know in order to make money as a band like your main income is touring and so we had to tour a lot and you can't, it's hard to be recording when you're on the road all the time. So it's actually kind of a luxury as much as it's like, I actually do miss doing shows and it's been, it's been really hard for a lot of artists. And like, we got, we were lucky that the timing of the pandemic and us finishing our album lines up with like a record deal and a publishing deal. So financially we're going to be okay. But for the most part, like our income comes from touring and we can't do that. So, and a lot of artists are in the same boat. Um, 
So that's the negative side of it, but the positive side means that we can just make more, record more music. Yeah, super great. Um, that's really, you know, the bulk of the questions that I kind of had today. Um, is there any like last words or anything else that you kind of want to just share with, uh, you know, anyone listening? Uh, I don't I know. No, that was like I, a super question. <laughs> I guess like that's be grateful for water, be grateful for like drink water. And uh, yeah, like it's kind of like a little practice every day that it's easy to get distracted by different things in life. But sometimes something that helps me is just like finding simple things that I can be grateful for. And water is one of them. It's like, it's, and it's something so common that we can take for granted, but like, like even like when I was in Brazil in the jungle, you have like, the, there's like the river water is it. And like the community that live there, they're used, they're used to drinking from it, but like, or even just like in Brazil city, like you can't drink from the tap, you know, it all has to be bottled water or like, you know, Flint, Michigan, you know, like, they haven't had clean drinking water for a minute and it's something that or even people who have to like walk and walk and walk to like have access to it I just feel like to be able to just literally turn on a tap is such like it's something that it's so easy to just kind of take for granted but when you kind of like make an effort to celebrate to celebrate that then like I don't know like if you if you have a practice of experiencing small gratitude every day, kind of you can build on it and you don't feel like your life sucks as much. So, um, yeah, I would say celebrate water because water is life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> so much, you know, for, for taking the time to chat. I know obviously it's a weekend um, and it was, it was really great chatting with you.